great crowd. We're filling up the room. Uh, it's really great to be here. And uh, I'd like to thank, uh, well, Jake for that nice introduction, and of course, Jeffrey for the, uh, for the invitation to come out. It's a pleasure to uh, be here at UHV as part of the ABR reading series. Uh, as Jeffrey was saying, I, I've been affiliated with ABR and associate publications for many, many years. And, but even so, and of all the hundred plus places that I've uh, visited and given presentation, I can't say that I've ever had my image on a bookmark which are available here. So uh, this will be sort of like my new selfie stick, I guess. So where, so where to begin? I mean, Alt-X is now 25 years old. So put that uh, in perspective, right? Probably of that the vast majority of you here today weren't even really born. But the internet was actually being born or birthed at that moment in time. We're talking the early 90s. And the kind of funny thing about it was that you, you could barely download anything. The only thing you could do in those days, for the most part, was download what we called hypertext. Does anybody know what hypertext is? Right, with a hypertext link. So everything was kind of, at that time, driven by text that you would click on, and it would take you to another page with more text to link on, uh, to click on, and et cetera. So uh, and then eventually, little by little, you could put in images, like a still image, or what we call an animated uh, GIF, Right, like the peanut butter GIF, even though it's spelled G-I-F. Who here knows what a what a GIF is? Right? Does anybody create their own animated GIF just for fun? So, so all of a sudden, as a writer, someone who had published a few novels, like the Kafka Chronicles and Sexual Blood, which you can probably just buy off the internet right now if you wanted to, uh, all of a sudden I had an opportunity with through this publication and some other uh, affiliate artists who I was working with to experiment with writing on the internet. And I had to really move with the internet at that moment in time because things were developing really fast. This was the era of what they called the dot com. So if I could all of a sudden now not only have links that I could click on, but animated and still still images, now I had like a visual component to it. And then as I as the as the work was developing, I thought, well, what does it mean to want to maybe even put sound in my online novel? Well, eventually some streaming audio made its way. You know, this is, of course, pre-Spotify, when we could all just access sounds on the internet wherever we are, whenever we want to. So this was a really, like, a, a transformative time in both the history of literature, but also technology and culture. We were experiencing this in real time, and we were having to sort of invent the new forms of art and the new forms of writing as the, uh, the technology was developing. And again, this is, just again, put it in perspective, it's pre-mobile phone, pre-smartphone as well. So I was really interested in the history of avant-garde writing and literature and artists who were willing to experiment with writing in other media. That was just something that I was attracted to. So even though my novels were experimental and my writing was uh, pushing the boundaries of what one might want to do with the with the written word, I also wanted to experiment with text, with the written word in other media. So one of the, the projects that I developed and uh, Jake referenced is called Grammatron, and that was selected for the Whitney Biennial. Does anybody here know what the Whitney Biennial is? The Whitney Biennial of American Art is in New York City, it's the Whitney Museum, and every other year uh, they invite a uh, select, very select group of artists to show in their museum, and it's considered kind of a prestigious event, but the year that, that Grammatron was uh, selected, which was 2000, that was the first time they ever included what they called internet art. So let me give you an idea what that looks like, and keep in mind, uh, Grammatron just had its 20-year uh, anniversary last year. We had a two-day symposium around the work uh, in London, so put it in its historical perspective, and I'll show you what it looks like. All right, so you would start actually with that page. <clears throat> there's the, the still graphic. There's the animated GIF. And then we'd have to talk about it. We'd have to, uh, you could begin with it. You could have the companion theory guide. That was always kind of fun. So if I went to the, uh, there were two versions because we could code a different way. That was like the, does anybody know what that's a, a remix of? I think therefore I am. And who who wrote that? Say it again. 
You're close. That's you're there. Who? Descartes. Descartes, right, exactly. Rene Descartes. Mm. This was the image they used in the catalog for the Whitney as well. Because it just it's very simple, but it just kind of like, right? It said it all in a way for where we were at that moment in time. And so what I did at this at this point was like that one link actually randomly generated a whole bunch of potential links to the rest of the work, the document. I call it, uh, well, Ted Nelson, who invented hypertext, really, and the concept hypertext calls it the docuverse, the docuverse. So even though it says link and you can click on it and it will get you into the work, as uh, the person who's creating the work, the artist, I have no idea what link's going to come up. So think about that. If I don't know what link's going to come up, then it's not going to be a linear experience. It's going to take you into this kind of sprawl of potential text, potential storytelling. And so that means everything that I compose for the work has to somehow resonate right, with everything else I compose so that it still tells a story, even though everybody here who clicks on that link and then follows up on the other links is going to experience the work totally differently. Every reading is different. So, like, I don't know what's going to come up. Yeah, there it is. Anyways, I'm not going to read it. I just wanted to give you an idea of how it works. Can I read a little something just to loosen things up? So one of the things that I did with Alt-X was that I started the Alt-X Press. And I uh, did that with my friend Ron Sukunik, the late Ron Sukunik, who was one of the founding publishers of the American uh, Book Review. So we created this really... Uh, I think, exciting book series right at the time when little uh, personal handheld devices were coming out. Now, this when, when were the first, first iPhones released? Do you remember? 2007, 2010. I think it was closer to like 2007, but it's like around there. So we did this in 2000, and we, and we called it Fiction for Palm Pilots. Does anybody know what a Palm Pilot is? It's a pre- iPhone, like it was like this little person, they called it a PDA, a personal digital assistant. You'd hold it in your hand. And so the idea was like you could download the books onto your little personal reader and then take it around with you everyone to go, an electronic book. But if you wanted to, you could also click on a link for a print-on-demand version, right? So then you'd go somewhere else and you'd click on a link, you'd pay for it, and then they, you'd get this in the mail, just like you do with Amazon right now. In fact, the company that Amazon does all of its print-on-demand books demand books with is the company we started with before anybody knew who they were. So this is a very early kind of iteration of what we think of as like reading ebooks online and getting the print version through Amazon. I'm going to read a couple segments from a text called OK Text. You ever go like on the computer, you're, you know, you're surfing around and you get a, you're doing stuff on your desktop and you get a little dialogue box that tells you something, it gives you a message, and the only choice you have is to click OK to get rid of it. It's just like letting you know something. So I was kind of annoyed by those a little bit. I was like, why are you telling me this? And why, you know, get away. I'm like swatting, fly swatting. OK. So I decided I'd make some, create some of my own OK text just for the fun of it. And this is a fun way, by the way, to generate new material. If you're having difficulty just trying to think about, like, how am I going to write something, just take on a form that pre-exists and experiment with it. Like a list is a good way to do that. Just do a, a sort of a fake list of some kind and turn it into a fiction if you want. So here are my OK texts. Technological determinism will cause you great pain. Continue. You have no choice. You have to click OK. Your health will one day disappear and you will die without meaning. <laughs> End session. <laughs> OK. Oblivion is the only cure for agony. Repeat escape function. <laughs> Okay. Multinational corporations create user-friendly software so that you will always depend on their lens to the world. More codependency? Okay. We cannot process your information. Your information is corrupt and needs cleansing. Erase brain? Okay. The machine cannot find your memory. Imagination cache has been obliterated. Restore default dreams? Okay. 
revolutionary doublespeak has engendered a new information war. The system is about to crash. Download drugs now? A transfer of $247,789.40 is about to download. Are you sure you want to disconnect? Okay. It gives you an idea of some of the fun stuff we were doing. And I, I continue to experiment with, uh, with my writing, but in more elaborate multimedia forms. Some of them appear on the internet as net art, and you can see them if you just go to my site at markamerica.com, which is where this stuff is. Uh, the other uh, thing I like to do is show them in museums, sometimes just to do like an installation with digital work. But at, at the core of everything I do is my love of and passion about writing and creative writing. So it's informed by, by my, for lack of better, let's call it my poetic or my aesthetic sensibility. When I was a young guy, I just found myself reading and writing all the time. I don't, you know, it wasn't like I even got, got trained to do that. Some people are lucky enough to where like they grow up in a place where like it's really pushed on them and then they, they, they do it. That wasn't my case and I sort of had to discover it myself. But it opened up so many possibilities for me that uh, I felt really lucky about that. And so uh, after Grammatron, right, like I said, I was going with the developments and the technology. Grammatron was released in 1997, okay? Just to remind you, I go back some of these. This is what this is what it looked like when we began. Right, you're about to enter Grammatron. Please wait while the machine reads you, and then it would launch like a soundtrack. See if the sounds work in here. Should, and then all of a sudden, you'd have these animated gifs. You'd have this text, and they were just moving on their own. Now, of course, nowadays, if you just go into Vimeo or YouTube or whatever, you're just playing videos. But none of that was possible because we had these little modems. We just didn't have the power, the bandwidth, to put all that kind of data through. So what were we doing? We were making animated GIFs. We were writing code that would change the screen and automatically flip it. And this was like a really big development. We had streaming audio that could play at the same time. So a lot of people's computers were crashing when they came to this work. This was like one of the most advanced art, narrative, literary experiences you could have in 1997. And it plays with a lot of stuff. Uh, language gender identity, technological dysfunctionalism, a lot of the themes that are still around today, it kind of anticipates. And again, where that story comes from, imagination cash has not been obliterated. <laughs> so it's even referring to itself, this electronic writing space, right? Because that's what I'm investigating here, it's an electronic writing space. Change, you want, to, you want to change, you want to go somewhere, you want to go somewhere fast, really fast. I slowed it down a lot. Somewhere different? So you get a feel for what it's like, and then eventually uh, the work actually will uh, 
hell is it? Eventually, it takes you to this screen. Let me get rid of the sound. Uh, eventually, it takes you to this screen. That goes like seven minutes long as an intro. So you really had to have patience, which in those days, most folks did because they had never seen anything like this. Now it's like, what, after two minutes or 30 seconds, you're ready to go somewhere else? It's like, okay, I've had enough of that. Let's see what else is going on. So, so just to remind you, like, so here's a story that I'm writing that has over a thousand of these screens and tens of thousands of links, and somehow the story has to hold together no matter how you navigate your way through it. And it's called Grammatron. So it's like grammatology, you know, the study or the science of writing. The idea of writing meets this notion of the machine. And if you think back to the old uh, Kabbalah and some of their mystical writings, there's something called the golem. Does anybody know what the golem is? What's the golem? Like a fake man made of clay that if you put a letter on this clay, uh, fake clay man's head, it comes to life. And so it becomes just almost like the first cyborg, like the first man-machine interface. So I'm really interested in that as I'm writing this story about Grammatron because we're really starting to investigate the man-machine interface. So I, I, I call my lead character or persona in the work Abe Golem. Abe, like kind of like the first man, like Abraham, and Golem, like the first man machine that uh, takes place. That story gets takes place in Prague, by the way, Prague, Czech Republic. I'm just going to read this so you get a sense of what the story is about, and we're going to move on. But so the first screen you come to after that long intro where you hear the soundtrack and you watch those screens and images, animated GIFs, right, play out, says Abe Golem, legendary info shaman. Cracker of the Sorcerer Code and creator of Grammatron and Nanoscript sat behind his computer, every speck of creative ore long since excavated from his burnt out brain, wondering how he was going to survive in the electrosphere he had once called home. His glazed donut eyes were spacing out into the vast electric desert, looking for more words to transcribe his personal loss of meaning. I'm Abe Golem, an old man. I drove a sign to the end of the road, and then I got lost. Find me. And so you see the repeating of the interface, right? So we were really experiment I was really experimenting with the idea of the animated GIF, you know, that's what, what I had, so that's what I played with. If you look closely in the face, first of all, the face is yours truly, so I'm now playing the character of Abe Golem, the man-machine interface. That's the outlines of my profile a few years ago. And then in the face is actually this very screen, like this stuff right here, that's what you're seeing in there. And so, not that you absolutely need to know that, but these are the kinds of decisions that I was making all along the way as I was in investigating, trying to look at what's possible with this new form of writing. And so you can, you know, you just click wherever you want. It would be like, Golem had an alternate persona, Grammatron. Grammatron was known for being a genderless prognosticator of electronic rifts spreading itself throughout the electrosphere. Golem, posturing himself on the net as the Grammatron guru, made it clear that the various fragments he sent out into the net came attached with encrypted supplementary data that, when pieced together, would turn on the receiver at the other end to the most advanced programming language ever created, the language of desire gnawing at consciousness bleeding. So, that's just one quick little route. We could have gone all these other different ways too. And so folks would just get completely lost in that narrative. I was lucky because there was nothing else on the internet at that time. Nowadays, there's way too much competition. You gotta even be more clever. And the net developed really fast. So within, literally, within three years of creating this work, we now had a program that we could play with called Flash. Who here knows what Flash animation is? 
Now keep in mind for this next work, I got a commission from the ICA in <laughs> London to show this work called Film Text, to create it and exhibit it in this really nice uh, contemporary art space in London. We were experimenting now with what we could do with sounds and images and text in a completely different way. And I'm just going to play it for you because I think of film text as like a narrative machine that you, that we, the users, can remix at will. And I won't read it and just give you a feel for it. You can find it at my website, markanerica.com. Uh, let me see. Just go and it, just do backslash film text. <laughs> Who are the ghosts in a literary machine? Who are the network conductors? Who writes the action scripts? I cannot stop myself from texting the data. Texting wasn't happening then, by the way. Database. Digital being. And then here it says, authorize for next level. So it plays with the idea of a game interface too. This came out in 2001, I kid you not. Opening shot, an empty desert landscape. Nothing happens here, nobody lives here. Cut to digital landscape, desert apparition of a dream. Okay, okay. First voiceover, to each being several other lives were due, and I tried to live them all, walking through them all, into them all, between them all. So you can read the secret notes if you find them, all the different keys. And there's like, I think, a total of nine scenes that you can interact with. Okay, so that gives you a taste of, of that work. It kind of transports you to another space, yeah? Does anybody, before I, I, I have a couple other things to show you and then I'm gonna close up, but does anybody, because I'm moving away now from the internet art and the hypertext. Does anybody have any questions about that? You just wanted to ask. So, yeah, so these works sort of straddle the literary and the artistic, and they use oftentimes the internet as the uh, 
as kind of the mediating device to try and explore the potential of new forms of writing. I actually call that kind of writing that you saw there in the last piece, uh, excuse my French, I don't really speak it, image écriture, right? So that means like image writing. But it takes on a different flavor if you research the, the notion of écriture in contemporary French philosophy. So I've made so many different works, and I can't really you know, touch on them all, of course. But I thought I'd, I'd show you a couple of the recent things I've been doing. Because I, even though there, you could see a little bit of my uh, image there, I was wearing the hat, the shadow figure in those images and in that earlier stuff. I haven't really come, come out into the, uh, in front of the camera. And so I decided at this point in my life, I had all, you know, in so in 1981, do a little history here. What happened on August 1st, 1981? It's an important day in American cultural history. That's when they launched MTV. <laughs> it was the day they launched MTV. Believe it or not, it was that long ago. And I was in college then. I was around your guys' age. <clears throat> and I was fascinated by it. I just couldn't believe like this was now going to be something that we would have in our life. That was really unusual. And I wanted to make a music video. Like, that's what I wanted to do. But I didn't. I couldn't. I didn't have the production uh, uh, tools at my fingertips. Couldn't afford it. Fortunately, now that I run a lab at the University of Colorado, where I have all kinds of technology, and we all have access to so many simple like consumer recording technologies, I worked with a couple of my students, and we started creating music videos. So can I, can I end by showing you my latest music video made, this is with my, so one of my students, her name is Laura Kim. She's really amazing artist. She's Korean American artist. And we were, we had, a, we had a discussion about something we called the digital afterlife. We're like, what's the digital afterlife? Is there a digital afterlife? And what does that mean? And so we decided we were just going to explore it. We were going to have a little rap and I was going to play this character kind of like a, Sort of like a German kraut rock guy. Okay? And she's going to be kind of like this K-pop rapper. Because that's where she comes from, Korea. So it's just under four minutes. And we've been... Uh, it has to be under four minutes, right? So we've been playing around with this. And uh, let me see where it is. It's one of these. Oh, here it is. Oh, boy. Here it comes. Hopefully the connection will play it all the way through without stopping. Digital Afterlife, if you, uh, just so that you can follow it, there are the lyrics. There is no rewind button for life. Psychic automatons, we work, work. Psychic automatons, we work, work. It's time to align with the cosmic jerk. Psychic automatons, we work, work. The digital, the digital, the digital, digital, afterlife, post your time, Post your mind in unreal time, becoming a meme, me, 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 let's go for the ride in my ontological hive. Are you contagious? Contagious enough? Is your avant-garde way too much? Is it just me? How could it be? I'm just a brand, the anti-selfie. Digital, digital, after life, Post your mind in unreal time, becoming a meme, me, 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 me. Let's go for the ride in my ontological hive. Aesthetic currency, signature effect, interface value, attention defect. Take it from me, imagination's free, a perfectly branded commodity. Is it just me? How could it be? I'm just a phantom with no ID, the digital afterlife. The digital afterlife. Okay, and we're going to end it with the video. There is no rewind button for I'm <laughs> sorry.
Okay, that's where I'm going to end it.